Okay. So thank you again for giving us the opportunity of presenting this work here. So what uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, an approach we've tried with my group in Naples, uh, many people collaborated and friends at Salerno at, at Nienea on trying to capture the regional differences that are uh, typical of uh, the Italian situation. In particular, this is our motivation. Regionalism is an important part of the Italian constitution. We have seen over the past uh, a few weeks that each region is in charge of its own share of the national health service. It can, of course, strengthen or weaken in some cases, although this is a very controversial issue. National containment rules and mitigation rules decided by the government. And also, we have heard a lot about the possible effect of flows between regions in it. So we try to tackle this problem, and in particular, here is our crucial overarching goal, trying to investigate the whole of the country as a network of regions, each modeled with different parameters. What are the motivating key research questions that we have in mind? And of course, I must say, this is work we started over the past three, four weeks. So this is an overarching goal that uh, we partly show you our preliminary results today. So first of all, can we detect from the available data if and when measures taken by the Italian government had an effect? And were there differences in the regional implementation or regional effects of these measures? Secondly, what is the effect of regional heterogeneity and how it can play a role? This is another important issue. Finally, what about the effects of people moving across the region and can we decide differentiated region-specific intervention strategies using control theoretic tools, optimal control, switching control and so on. So the idea is the following. The idea is to model the country as a network that you see here on the on the right. Let me so as a network of 20 regions uh, interconnected by short proximity flows, maybe because of commuter flows between neighboring regions, or even longer flows, air traffic, here you see some just of them, or major ferry routes between the island re region and, uh, and the Italian continent. So we are trying to capture all these aspects into a network model of uh, of the epidemic spread in Italy. What did we do? Let's start with the regional model. So here is our, uh, the model we use, is an SIR modified model, where we have the success suspectables, we have the number of infected, we have a compartment for the quarantine, a compartment for the hospitalized, then we have a compartment for the deceased and a compartment for the recovery. Now you see the links showing the connections between the compartments and the various parameters. Again, this is the regional model. The links among the compartments that you see are the result of a data analysis, a several identification trial, where we decided at the end to keep some of the links. It seemed from the data that these were the links that allowed us to capture what we were seeing in the data. Some assumptions that we made uh, are the following. So, uh, first of all, let me, uh, first of all, well, let's look at the data that uh, we have available. I plotted this in red. You see, we have from the Protezione Civile almost on a daily basis now. We have the number of quarantined, of hospitalized, of the deceased, and for the recovered. Since we have this link from the infected to the recovered themselves, we're only assuming we know the number of recovered that are those that were previously in hospital or previously quarantined. So what are the assumptions? We fix some parameters from some consensus we found in the literature, in particular beta and gamma, that are the, the two parameters you see here, and also we made an answer. The answer is, as also um, Beppe said uh, earlier on, that the parameters must change, and they must change over certain time windows. 
what we wanted to detect were the breakpoints. In other words, one of the questions we asked ourselves was, can we actually, by analyzing and looking at the data, identify the breakpoints where the, there is a consistent change in the parameters? So we wanted to find the parameters per each region and also when they change. And I tried to put together a cartoon to show you the gist, the real essential components of our identification strategy. So what we start with, we start with what we have. And what we have is this, the total number of cases that have been detected. So it's the number of these compartments. So using the CI, we actually look at the first bit of the model, the bit that involves S, I, and the CI. You see here with the hats, the parameter that are being estimated. Beta are the parameters and gamma are fixed. And this bar here, uh, I apologize for that, is just to keep consistency of the slide graphically. This represents the division by the compartments that are involved in the model, so the normalization. We assume that we have some data available, as I said, the data above, in particular CI, and using our own NEDOC uh, identification algorithm that I can briefly say basically uses a type of uh, least squares on several sub-interval of the window and then uses a statistical test to decide how significant parameters uh, estimated over different sub-intervals are, we estimate the first set of parameters. The raw i, which will be very important in what I am going to tell you next, which is the effect of the social distancing rules in each region, uh, the parameters from the compartments too, the number of infected that we need to estimate because we don't have as those who came before me clearly highlighted, we don't have that information, but also the duration of that window. So when are those parameters remaining constant? We then go into the other set of equations, and again, using the available data, and in this case, using a much simpler least squares identification algorithm, we estimate the rest of the parameters. So we repeat these for all the regions. Of course, we played also with the national data. And here is what you get. You get clearly the fitting. You see the parameter changes. These are automatically detected by the identification algorithm. And we were very proud that some of our early predictions, actually on the national level, you see here the prediction on the 24th of March was actually, unfortunately, very close to what happened in the, in the, in the next weeks that we lived uh, through. Of course, now we repeated this identification exercise for each region, and we got a picture of the entire country. Before going into the network model per se, let me show you some of the things that we observed from, data, uh, uh, from our data analysis. And I chose two examples, the case of Lombardy in the north and the case of Campania, the region where Naples is in the south. So here you see our estimated parameters. In particular, I want you to focus on this, which is the effect of the social distancing and on this column, which is the mortality rate. So if we look at this data and the breakpoint, here are the time windows that were detected automatically from our identification algorithm, we see a notable change from the first window to the second, and this corresponds to when there was the first lockdown in Lombardy of the um, of the initial outbreak of the epidemics. We also saw something that I'm mentioning as an observation, so it reserves and deserves much more uh, investigation. We noticed also, you see here, that the mortality rate in that week seems to have a uh, step forward. And if you look at the last column here, this seems to correspond to when the hospital system, the health service in the region became temporarily saturated. So it seems that 
there might be an effect on Zinta of the level of saturation of the hospitalization rates. Further on, if we move to the next window, you can see here that clearly we see the effect in Lombardy of the national measures taken on the 8th of March 2020 when the total lockdown was declared. This is well captured by the model. I want again to show you the Zeta column because we see a variation and so in our model we played with a function that correlates the Zeta i, that is that parameter linking that compartment HI with the DI in, in the model itself to the H, to the level, to the ratio between the number of hospitalized and the actual available beds that, as we know, regions have tried to compensate for through the epidemic's outbreak. So let's now move to Campania. Here, there is another interesting observation. Campania, you see, we luckily had here in the south a very low number of cases at the beginning, but I want you to notice this sharp increase in the window 2nd, 21st of March. One possible reason might be the famous and uh, infamous, I should say, north to south flux that was much publicized on the on the media that followed the first general lockdown. A lot of people moved from the north to the south. The southern governors, presidents of the regions, acted upon by severe lockdown measures in some villages of town. And this seems to have worked because you can see that after that initial increase, we see in the subsequent window a consistent decrease, which is also consistent, by the way, with the sort of order of magnitude of the other regions like Lombardy per se. So let's move now to the network model. So we now have identified the models of each one of the nodes in the region. We need to introduce the fluxes between the regions. You see here, phi ij is the flux of people moving from region i to region j. And it's a ratio so that the sum of the outgoing flows from that region is normalized to one. If we add the flows to the regional model, what we get is the network model that we considered and played with over the past few weeks. I must say that network models of, or SEER network model abound in the literature. We adapted a model that was proposed to model dengue fever in Brazil in 2015 and that also in earlier papers in 2003. What are the key features of this model? Let me highlight here the importance of the fluxes. You see here that we have a percentage of the population coming out of region I which interact with the infected in the other regions with which it is connected. Of course, this includes also the auto loop, the self loop phi i i. So it includes also the case, of course, where you take the region and disconnect it from the rest. Another feature, this parameter zeta, that actually becomes a function of this ratio that we looked at with particular care because I think it's an important element to design also control strategies at the decentralized regional level, which is the ratio between the number of hospitalized HI and the total threshold, TIH, each region has on the number of, of uh, beds in hospital. This is now a very important issue, especially for those from abroad. In Italy, we have a dramatic variation of the NHS capability across the regions. And so these, I believe, must be taken into account. Finally, you see the normalization NIP, where without spending too much time on it, depends on the flows of people coming in and coming out. So it's the present population in region I. So what we did with this, the next step was estimating the fluxes. There is some very little freely available data. We contacted Terralytics who asked for about a thousand uh, euros per month, which we currently don't have. So we went and did a sort of 
qualitative estimation of the fluxes to start with from the available sources. Um, of us went on to Skyscanner and Enoch looked at the number of planes between regions, the capacity of the planes, etc., and tried to get an idea. So we have a sort of, uh, in these first examples, I will show you the flows have been estimated through these available data with a simple mobility model to estimate, the, to estimate missing data, for example, on road transport. And so, so this is an aspect that uh, can be improved. So now we have a parameterized model for each region. We have fluxes estimated from available databases, and we can do some preliminary model analysis. Here, what is the message I want to uh, portray? That network models show clearly that heterogeneity counts. And this is not only our model, but also other models in the literature. I became aware just a few days ago of this nice paper by Marino Gatto and Andrea Rinaldo that is coming out in the NAS, where they also had a similar independent idea using a network model at the provincial level to describe the spread of the disease. Unfortunately, well, I, don't, I haven't access to the supplementary data, so I don't have all the details of the model to make a proper comparison with the one we used. So what are, why is this heterogeneity counts? Because if you do a local analysis at the beginning of the epidemics, something like uh, Francesco did before me, you see that it's very essential to look at this matrix K. And this matrix K is the well-known next generation matrix that here I give you just a generic element that depends on the social distancing effects, Roger, in that region, on the flows through and out of that region. So you can define two generalized uh, basic reproduction numbers that Thomas was mentioning earlier on, one at the regional level, which also involves the fluxes, and one at the national level. And it's very important to notice that the row of K, the spectral radius of the matrix K, is a good indicator, a good proxy for a basic reproduction number typically used in the literature on network model. We have also played, but unfortunately I don't have time to go into details, with the matrix measures of these next generation matrix, because they can yield sufficient conditions, particularly in non-Euclidean norms, in, 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 in measuring used by non-Euclidean norms, that can be useful, we believe, for control design. So now let's go a little bit into some of these model predictions. So I just want to finish showing you some of these things. First of all, regional differences count, and they count very much. Look at this scenario. We set the parameters on the 22nd of April, and we just imagine that one region, and I chose this in the honor of our organizer, reopens completely at time zero, relaxes completely just that region at time zero, its restrictions. What we see, we see that this primary infection in one region causes secondary infections in other regions, even away from it. Look at Sicily down here. And also we see some element of a kind of recurrent peak in some of our simulations. This causes the reopening of just one region, a, 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 of course, an outbreak at the national level. The number of the, on the axis are percentages of the population, but at this stage, because this is a preliminary investigation, I don't want to spend too much time on giving any quantitative, uh, um, say, uh, supposition of this, it's just qualitative at the time. So we come to our hot national debate of the day. What to do currently? And here are some, uh, I apologize if they are Italian, here are just some snippets from the press of the past few days. 18th of April 2020, a fight between the presidents of the regions, some want to open their region, some want to stay closed and safe. On the 19th of April, our Prime Minister declares we will have a homogeneous national plan for all the regions. But on the 21st, 
he announces that there will be a differentiated plan per region. And some governors are still wondering whether that's the best option. So what we try to do with this model is to simulate some possible scenarios. Let me show you what happens if we open all the regions at once. Of course, if all regions are open at once, we see immediately <laughs> an outbreak at the regional, at the national level. So what is a possibility here? And this combines the approach that Thomas proposed earlier on with that sort of regional action. Let's look now at what happens if each region opens or closes, so relaxes or strict, takes stricter lockdown measures on the basis of how far they are from saturating the hospital capacity. If we do that, here you see now that we are successfully able to keep all the number of hospitalized hospitalization below the saturation line in all regions. Here, red shaded areas show the lockdown in place and green areas show that the lockdown has been released. So this is in the presence of flows, but flows are to be dealt with very, very carefully because of what I said earlier on. And we see that this is also effective to contain the disease at the national level, at a very similar level of what a national lockdown strategy would do. So I don't have too much time uh, now to go into the details of these figures, but here you see some scenarios at the, where you have a national lockdown compared with differentiated lockdowns, where we see the same benefits. But I believe that if in the cost function we add also the economic costs of lockdown, we can allow some regions, you see some green, to go and work and have their economics restarted without impeding the, the various the whole country. Although these are qualitative considerations based on a, our preliminary investigations. What are the take home message I, uh, from our study? First of all, network models of the epidemics might be very tough to identify, I, uh, going back to what uh, Beppe said earlier on, but they can be useful to uncover the effects due to regional heterogeneity has also uh, many of you and many of us found in their homemade models, we found that it, the lockdown strategy was essential, it's effective, and whoever doubts its effectiveness, I think, uh, goes against all of these model predictions. We also saw that it's very important to carefully control the regional fluxes because they can have dramatic effects because of these local versus global effects. But I, for this, I, this is a very preliminary hint because it reserves much more careful investigation. But I believe that regional feedback interventions, as shown preliminarily by our model, can be beneficial in mitigating the effects of the outbreak while taking into account the peculiarities of the regions the regions in Italy are very different, very different in all sorts of aspects, and they can take actions. We saw a few days earlier the president of the Veneto region reopening the construction companies when this was basically forbidden, apparently, at the national level. So I want to end with a quote from our prime minister, who said that we need a differentiated a coordinated strategy. When I first read this on the newspaper, believe me, I didn't realize what he was saying. It sounded to me like a paradox. But now, after looking at the model and its prediction, I finally understand what he means. We need a differentiated policy in each region that needs to be coordinated at the flux level, because otherwise the economic impact might be really huge. Of course, there is a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, work to be done, so take these with a pinch of salt, because these are really preliminary investigation done over the past uh, three weeks and a half. I pressurized all of my students and asked my friends and collaborators 
to help with. So a huge thanks goes to all of them for uh, behaving me and my pressures over the past two weeks. Thank you, everyone. And Thank you very much. So Mario, this, this was really interesting because this is something that uh, actually I was also thinking to do. We need to put networks in, in, the, in the model because this is uh, a very important aspect that we should never forget. Uh, I think that we have questions uh, from uh, YouTube, right? Martina. Yes, we have a question from a YouTube participant, from Julie, and she's asking if um, that is important, the, the regional differences definitely count, and so do the country differences. So, can this approach be scaled up to cover not just Italy at the national level, but at an international level? So, uh, uh, thanks Julie for asking this question. Definitely, yes. I mean, as I said, I we mentioned the, the excellent work done by Andrea Rinaldo and Martino Gatto, that, that, that group that I only became aware of very recently, that looks at the provincial level. So they are interested more into the spread of the epidemics around Italy. But of course, the course at the level of granularity of these models can be adapted at the country level, at the province level. So this can be interesting also to highlight and study the regional spread and the provincial spread, but also countries. So I'm thinking of other federal countries. Italy is a pseudo-federal country by all means. The regions have a high degree of independence. And so this could be also scaled up or down to different levels and look at different areas, at different types of countries. But the issue, one of the issues that uh, uh, it's important, of course, is data availability and uh, yes, answer yes. Okay, Ma Mario, thank you very much again. This was really, really interesting. And uh, okay, another applause. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we can move to the last talk of the session. Before